Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, does this work? It works, okay, great. Uh, so first, maybe I should <laughs> apologize to, to the people who have heard the talk or part of the talk before. I don't want to bore you to death. Uh, okay, so today I'll be talking about um, uh, an algorithm uh, for uh, the dimensionality reduction of uh, time series. Okay, and uh, an important component of this algorithm is uh, PCA. So um, let's start by uh, first stating the problem. Okay, so, um, so what we have at our hands is a, is a data set of time series. So we've got uh, multiple time series. And we would like to represent each single entire time series as a two-dimensional point uh, in... Uh, in a low dimensional space. Okay, so I'll, here I'm trying to sketch the, the typical situation. So we have some high dimensional vectors and you want to do a uh, visualization, so you project them uh, down to 2D, right? So we want to do the same thing now, but we have a uh, time series uh, this time. Okay, so you may ask, of course, um, you know, uh, what's so special about you know, the time series. Is this really a problem? Can I not just use the, you know, the usual tools on the time series and get my visualization? And the thing is, that the answer is that sometimes this works indeed, sometimes it doesn't. And this is an example that um, got us started where it doesn't work. So uh, this, is a, this is a synthetic example. We generated some uh, time series for a Gaussian process that has two parameters, A and B. And we defined four classes in this uh, example. Each class had its own distinct uh, A and B parameters. Then we generate some time series, projected using, I think, uh, TISNI, if I remember correctly. And this is the result we got. So what you see here is the projection. Every color stands for a different class. And unfortunately, things are overlapping, which means that the dimensionality reduction algorithm cannot distinguish the temporal behaviors. Okay. So... And then you may ask, you know, why are time series different? And, uh, you know, a, s a simple uh, explanation from my side is that, you know, when you work with time series, there's certain things you have to take into account, such as, for instance, a shift invariance. Um, so what do I mean by this? So you may have uh, two time series, which are very, very similar to one another. And it so happens that one of them is a bit shift in time, right? And typically, we're not interested in this shift in time, so we still regard the two time series uh, as uh, similar. And the algorithm should be aware of this. It should understand this. And when it projects a time series, it should project them close together, right? So, uh, so this means that they're similar. Okay, it should uh, disregard this uh, shift in time. Uh, perhaps another issue is this of variable length. You know, you may have uh, longer time series, shorter time series. And, uh, you know, the length is not uh, necessarily an indication of uh, similarity, right, in any way. So the algorithm should be aware of this, and it should understand that, you know, just because the time series is shorter, so in this case, you know, the, you can see that they're similar, but this is a bit shorter, so the algorithm should see this and, you know, project them close together. Okay, so uh, the way we try to... Um, approach the, 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 this problem was um, um, in a first step we tried to capture the temporal behavior using something called the echo state network and then we took uh, probabilistic PCA and uh, we tried to uh, inject this uh, temporal behavior in it. Okay, so let me very quickly uh, say a few things about the echo state network. So here's a sketch of it. Uh, so just like in a standard uh, feed-forward neural network, you've got your uh, inputs here, which connect to the, to the hidden layer, which connect to the output layer. So here we've got the output weights W. Okay. Um, but in addition, you have some recurrent uh, connections here in the hidden layer so that the network forms a notion of memory. And, uh, and what is special about the EchoState network in particular is that uh, the only free... Uh, the only three parameters are set here at the outputs. So the input weights and the recurrent weights are randomly initialized. And then you keep them fixed and you never train them. Um, 
and there's some good theoretical reasons why this uh, why this works. And uh, okay, and so the the job of the EchoSay network is to you know it receives an input and it makes a prediction for the next uh, time step. So you give it a, uh, y11 and it should uh, predict uh, y12. Okay. Um, just like other recurrent networks, uh, the echo state network is governed by uh, these two equations here, uh, updating the state and producing a prediction. So x here is the, the, the hidden state of the network, so it, uh, it's the memory, it somehow summarizes you know, the sequence it has seen so far, uh, or at least the recent past of the sequence. And if you want to update your state after seeing a new observation, what you do is you, know, you just multiply the the new uh, incoming inputs with, uh, with the input weights, then you remember the previous hidden state, multiply it with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, the, with the weights of the recurrent layer, apply the nonlinearity, and this is how you get your updated state now. And um, typically in echo networks, if you want to make a prediction, all you have to do is just, you know, linearly multiply, um, sorry, just multiply with a matrix the, the, uh, the, the hidden state, and you get your your output. Okay, so uh, note that you know if I want to calculate the hidden states, I can do this, of course, independently of the of the predictions, right? Uh, so you know I can, I can I, you know if I if I have a sequence, I can start putting in the inputs one by one. I calculate the the states one by one, and uh, I can do this independently of the of the predictions, uh, of course. So, okay, so in this slide, I've got more or less the same stuff. But uh, what I want to say is that um, you know all those hidden states, which you know we can calculate independently of the of the output, we can collect them in a matrix, the so-called state matrix. It has as many rows as uh, time steps, the length of the sequence, and has as many columns as the size of the hidden layer in the network. Okay, and uh, once you have this matrix, if you now multiply it with some uh, um, with your with your output weights, you get your uh, prediction uh, vector, right? So the prediction for the for the entire uh, time series. Okay, so these are the two things we need to remember: the, the the state matrix and you know multiplying the state matrix with W gives you the predictions. Okay, so this is all I want to say about the echo state network. Now I will quickly talk about uh, probabilistic PCA, and this is the picture that goes with it. So probabilistic PCA says that, um, states the following thing. It says that uh, the high dimensional data you observe, uh, the nothing else but uh, the image of a low dimensional coordinate which, which gets linearly mapped to the high dimensional space, right? So we have uh, uh, a linear mapping, it's speci well, an affine map uh, specified by a matrix A and a vector b. So what you do is, here is your low dimensional uh, representation z, your two dimensional coordinates. Uh, you multiply with the matrix, then you shift it with the vector b, and this is how you go from, uh, from here to the high dimensional space, okay? This is what PCA says, and here we have uh, uh, a noise term, the, the, the observation uh, noise. And if you assume that it's Gaussian, then you can write this as a, as a Gaussian likelihood. And uh, probabilistic PCA goes on and says that, you know, I will impose a prior on my uh, latent uh, coordinates, uh, Z. If you have multiple data items, then you just multiply them, uh, you multiply all those quantities because they're just independent of uh, one another. And, uh, okay, so now we have many free parameters. We've got, the, you know, we have to figure out the mapping specified by A and B, and we also need to figure out the latent coordinates. So this is too many free parameters. So what uh, people do is they uh, marginalize over the z's, you integrate them out, and then you're left just with, uh, with the matrix uh, A, B, and the, and the noise term which you have to fit. And then you can just use your gradient, uh, uh, gradient optimization method and, uh, and fit them. Okay, so this is how probabilistic PCA works uh, very quickly. And this is what we did now uh, to incorporate this temporal behavior in, uh, in PCA. So um, we introduce this um, intermediate step now between uh, the latent coordinates and the, and the observed uh, data, the time series. 
and this intermediate step is, uh, you know, uh, going to this uh, weight space. So instead of going directly from, you know, the laden coordinate to the observed uh, time series, we first go through the through through the the space of uh, possible output weights, and then we go to a time series. Okay, and the way we do this is uh, it's it's relatively simple. So just like with probabilistic PCA, you know, we start with uh, the coordinate Z. Again, we multiply with the matrix A, we shift it, okay? And so we go from here to, to this point. Uh, then we multiply this quantity with uh, the state matrix. Remember, so this we, we can uh, pre-calculate independently of the predictions. Okay, so we have the, the state matrix here. And if we multiply this with, uh, with the state matrix, we get our predictions uh, Y. Okay. And for Gaussian noise, we can write again as a likelihood. And, uh, and then we just follow a probabilistic PCA. So all we do is, you know, just like probabilistic PCA, impose the prior, uh, write down the likelihoods, integrate out the latent variables, and then we optimize again exactly the same three parameters. And this is how we manage to, you know, incorporate this temporal behavior in probabilistic PCA. And um, so we can rewrite this like this. And now you see perhaps the, you know, how the latent coordinates instantiate the weights, which when multiplied with the state matrix give you the predictions. Okay? And the nice thing with this algorithm is that, you know, the echo state network is linear in the parameters. PCA is a linear model, so this integration is still possible. And uh, exactly, so everything can be done uh, analytically. Okay, so I think this concludes what I want to say about the algorithm. Uh, now very quickly some results. So here we can go back to the example I showed you at the very beginning. Uh, so this is the previous visualization. Now if we do the proposed uh, modified PCA, we get this visualization here on the synthetic data. Uh, you know, so you see that the class is separated now, and this means that you know probabilistic PCA can uh, understands, you know, can distinguish between the, di the different temporal behaviors. Okay. Um, here's another synthetic data set, which is very popular in uh, in the relevant uh, literature of echo state networks, the so-called NARMA series. Here's three classes, which, you know, if you visually inspect them, the, the you can't see any difference between them. Uh, so here you see two visualizations. Uh, one is um, what we did here was, you know, we fitted the echo state networks, then we took the fitted uh, weights and we used them as features and did a PCA on them, and that's the result that came out. Uh, and if you do the proposed approach, then you see that, you know, the temporal behaviors can be um, distinguished. So here's a real data set where things don't work as nicely. Unfortunately, so uh, this is a data set of uh, time series that originate from an uh, X-ray binary system. And uh, we've got 12 distinct classes, and here are some um, examples from, uh, from uh, each class. Okay, so we've got all these different classes. Again, here we've got two visualizations. So again, we did the same thing here. You know, we fitted the echo state network to every time series individually. And then we thought, you know, we could perhaps take the weights and use them as features, as an input to the to PCA. And uh, this is what comes out. And perhaps slightly more uh, <laughs> organized, uh, you see here the uh, our result with uh, the modified PCA. It's not perfect. There's a lot of overlapping, unfortunately. But okay, some classes seem to, um, you know, you can tell them apart. Uh, I can't remember the meaning of the, of the class anymore. Um, exactly, so now the algorithm can, you know, it sees some temporal, some difference in temporal behavior, but unfortunately it doesn't, uh, it, it can't fully resolve it. Uh. By the way, the, the circles are training data and the stars, you well, probably can't see it uh, so far, and the, the, the stars are the, the test data. Okay, so this concludes my talk. Um, so this... Uh, so uh, what I talked about was um, time series, how, why, how they're different to, you know, to, uh, to the more standard uh, vectorial uh, representation and why you have to treat them differently. Um, so we, we, we try to capture the temporal behavior of, uh, of a time series using the echo state network. 
we showed how we injected this behavior in the probabilistic PCA. And um, as I said, the, the nice thing about this work is that you know, the, the algorithm is uh, tractable in the end, and all operations can be done uh, analytically. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>